Um, so, as Michael alluded to, I'm a head of debt collection and publication at the Bank of England, so I'm responsible for the systems uh, that bring in all the data that we use um, uh, in the UK for, uh, for the, uh, all the bank users. Um, I also manage all our market data vendors and I, resp I also uh, represent the bank on a number of technical committees for a lot of the European agencies, uh, the LEI and also ISO 2022. I think the theme for this presentation is going to be look to the past to understand the future and to know where you, he where you might be headed. Right. If you look at the technology journey so far, so finance pretty much lags behind other industries when it comes to the use of technology, the application of standards, the way it uses its data, and generally collaboration. Right? If you look at things like supply chain and pharma, they're much further ahead. Now over the past decade, um, the industry has changed considerably, and not just in terms of disappearance of big players. We've seen um, technology really come into the, into the forefront here, right? Um, now, technology is constantly evolving, it has had a huge impact on the industry, and it's created new challenges, but also created new opportunities. And the main challenge now is really how to deal with the huge amounts of data that te the technology age has, has brought with it. Now, data held by firms of all sizes has increased exponentially over the recent years, meaning for firms to really operate really well and get the best value out of that, effective data mining is now a crucial part of a firm's operations. Um, another area of focus for technology companies has been, uh, and certainly fi finance firms, has been what well, data needs to be stored, it needs to be stored safely. And there's been more emphasis on that since um, the 9-11 attacks where, you know, I think the need for storage and, and, and uh, disaster recovery and things like that have really come to the forefront. Um, firms have had to invest he more heavily in cybersecurity given sort of potential penalties for losing data but also kind of the dev devastating reputational impacts if data is lost. Now, over the last 10 years, we've seen finance become increasingly globalized. Um, uh, largely due to technology. So if you look back not so long ago, London and New York were the main hubs. But these days, Dubai, Hong Kong, Sao Paulo have all caught up. Um, and now, you know, uh, transactions can be sort of conducted across the globe at any time of the day. So what we've also seen because of technology is the biggest financial firms getting bigger, but it's also spurred opportunities for smaller, more specialist firms driving innovation and helping create a huge number of jobs worldwide. Fintech firms in particular have been emerging over the recent years. You know, fintech's a great buzzword, but ultimately what they're doing is technology and finally applying what we've seen happening on the web to other, other areas such as retail and so on, to applications in finance. Um, so, yeah, gone are the days when personal or even business banking were the sole domain of suited men in an office block in London or Paris. These days, you know, leading innovators in finance tend to be young startups, many of them breaking the established rules, understanding what's going on with like the millennial generation and providing goods and services that match the needs of that particular generation. Um, and now that also online securities massively improved, particularly over the last 10 to 15 years, the trend is towards more mobile. Right? So mobile is now the fastest growing platform for banking transactions for both individual and consumer businesses. Now I can't remember the last time that I've actually logged on to my online banking. I do all my banking through mobile. I do all my transactions through my mobile apps or through seamless integration. Right? So I want it to be faster, easier, but also it's through vendors I trust, going back to um, Michael's point. Now, looking ahead, this drive towards mobile so looks set to continue. Um, and, you know, some people feel that digital currencies such as Bitcoin could start to grow in popularity and significance. Now, I'm still skeptical. Yes, it's popular, but the uptake of it hasn't really been there. And there's still some trust, some kind of operational uh, organizational issues to overcome with things like digital currencies. Now, should that turn out to be the case, the next 10 years could be as eventful as the past decade, where we've seen a lot of change. Now, things like Bitcoin distributed ledgers have a, have a potential to transform 
how we work and how we operate as a society. But for me, a lot of it's a lot of hype at the moment. Right? We're not, until we start seeing real world practical applications that have the structures around them, we're not really going to, uh, it's not going to perhaps move as, as, for example, VC investors might think it might move. Now, given the pace of the last, of change in the last 10 years, or even, um, uh, so given the pace of the change that we've seen in the last 10 years, Thinking about what 10 or 20 years like, looks like in the world of finance is a quite a difficult challenge. Right? Uh, finance is a slow beast, and it you know, looks, look, I mean, if you look at some of us in the room, our regulators, right? We are slow beasts. Really frankly. <coughs> Technology moves faster than us. So when we think about things like reg tech, I always think that the technology is always going to move faster than the regulations. And it, for me, there's a bit of a mismatch there, right? So this presentation is really going to focus on kind of the six key parts of the financial ecosystem, looking at kind of what some of the trends were to date, um, what question these, these trends sort of raise about the future, um, what some of the possible scenarios for the future are, and some key takeaway points for the future as well. Um, just to set the scene, this shows sort of global investment in fintech over the, the last seven well six years up to Q, uh, Q1 2017. And you can see, I mean, it's grown, what, six, uh, five to six fold over a six year period. So it shows the amount of technology investment and the, and the pace of change uh, and the opportunities that are presented in this space. Um, some interesting stats to set the scene for what we're gonna be talking about for parts of the ecosystem. So by 2020, so three years time, um, PwC did a survey, um, I can't remember what, report it was in, but 28% of banking and payments, those people that were surveyed felt 28% of banking and payments businesses is at risk because of um, new innovations, new fintech development, and that's traditional um, businesses as they stand today. 22% of insurance, asset, and wealth management businesses are at risk because of fintech innovation technology. Um, and in three years' time, there'll be 20 times more usable data than today. If you think about what opportunities that then gives us, right? So, eighty-one percent of banking CEOs are concerned by the speed of technological change more than any other industry sector. Now, it, you know, to put that into context, finance is slow. There's la lack of collaboration, a lot of legacy systems. But here, you've got technology coming through and, and making change, while you've got these huge beasts of, of of firms not being able to react to that change as quickly as they might hope. Now, 63% of insurance CEOs believe Internet of Things will be strategically important to their organizations. And obviously, cybersecurity will continue to be one of the top risks facing financial institutions. So 69% um, of CEOs are somewhat or extremely concerned by cyber threats. I personally think that's too low, but anyway. So let's look at the financial ecosystem. Um, so for the purposes of this presentation, I've just cut it up into six parts, there's probably a couple of others like regulation and so on in there. But we've got payments, banking, lending, insurance, markets and investment management. So let's take them one by one and um, let's have a look at payments. So if you look at the story so far, so to date the major forces shaping the future of payments were mobile payments, in the case of Apple Pay or Alipay, right? Now interestingly, um, we'll go into this in a shortly, but Alipay has, uh, I think, uh, 30 times the number of users in China than, than Apple Pay does, but Apple being the most valuable company in the world. So I think there's about 60 million Apple Pay users versus 450 million Alipay users, which is quite an interesting stat. Payments rails, so new methods of payment, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, have, have kind of come to the forefront and are being increasingly used. And seamless payments. Uber's a really good example of that, where you don't even know if a payment's occurred. You just order your cab, you get in, and off you go. And then your card's built, but you don't have to go, oh, I've paid for this. You might select your payment method, but that's, these are the sorts of trends that we've seen. And the questions that have been asked today have been, well, how might the dominant form, and these are the questions I kind of want to think about rather than sort of explore here. I'm just gonna sort of pose them where, how might the dominant form factor of payments change? And Will incumbent payment networks be able to respond to new entrance payment infrastructures? What role will payments play in the broader suite of offerings from financial institutions? 
And will the rise of multinational lead, uh, multinationals lead to global convergence around patents? So the trend so far has been, well, payments continue to migrate away from cash and become less visible as purchases <coughs> shift online and to mobile. Payments businesses are experiencing intense pressure on margins in the face of competition and challenging regulatory environments. Um, regional distinctions between payments ecosystems are growing, so the Alipay versus Apple Pay is a really good example of that, um, where, um, where you've got different customer behaviors and regulatory environments emerging. But what hasn't really been the trend has been, well, mobile payments haven't been sufficiently exceeded by the functionality of pre-existing solutions in cloud-based markets. We're still attached to our cards, right? There's an element of trust there. And while mobile's becoming more and more the forefront because it's easier, it's more convenient, and works really well with certain services, we may use less cash, but we certainly aren't moving away from card anytime soon. Um, and customer acceptance of non-traditional payment schemes all remains almost non-existent. Now, there is a lot of hype that, yes, I'm using Bitcoin and I can use Bitcoin to go and pay for my coffee. But the reality is of, of it is that we'll just whip out our card and, and pay with contactless. Right? Um, so that's been the trend to date. But what does that raise in terms of questions about the future? Well, will we see the future of payments diverge into two worlds? So a purely retail experience and a purely online experience. <laughs> or can they be bridged, possibly? This seamless integration piece where you could potentially walk into a store, buy your clothes and walk out, and it knows that it's almost like the new Amazon kind of grocery shops, it's all seamless payments. It's a really good example of that. Um, who, is best to, who is best positioned to benefit from the monetization of payments data? That's, that's a huge granular data set that, that is coming you know, more and more available to uh, merchants and so on. How do you monetize that, and, and who is best placed to do that? Now, will PSD2 create new payments value chains in Europe? Possibly. <coughs> will mobile payments ever capture a, a major sort of double-digit share of retail payments in card-based countries? Possibly in time, but the, it goes with the whole customer and user experience, right? And, and retail, <coughs> all forms of all forms of retail uh, will have to evolve to kind of change that experience. And what will the first national digital currency look like, and how far away is it? Well, you know, it depends on who you talk to. Some, some countries uh, want to be at the forefront of it because that's, um, they are in that kind of emerging infrastructure. They can make those sort of bold changes, but uh, countries such as the UK, that's a much more <coughs> difficult question to answer. So here's a three sort of possible scenarios for the future of payments. So uh, payments institutions turn from sort of cash cows to lost leaders. Right, so issuers face lower interchange revenues, customers turn to alternatives for revolving credit, customers are conditioned to expect free payments, I mean, that's, that could quite well become the norm. Right? And payments, but payments choices for customers decline, there's obviously more conversions, <coughs> less providers, you know, there's, less, there's less money in it. Right? Um, two ecosystems develop post PSD2, so banks develop their own open APIs, uh, payment APIs, um, merchants develop online payment tools that bypass intermediaries. We're already seeing a lot of that, and I, I, I think actually that's quite a, you know, a likely scenario in that. Um, the online retail payments ecosystem diverges. I think there's an element of that being true because you know, people, some people just like to go into a shop, but some, a lot of people just want the ease and convenience. My wife, for example, will only shop on Amazon. Right? She doesn't go into the store anymore. But as their kind of experience evolves, she does more and more through that channel. Um, and customers are entrenched in online ecosystems. Well, you know, my wife's a really good example of that. Right? She, she does everything online. Um, increasing fragmentation. So merchants and intermediaries create personalized payment solutions, right, as we see happening in different regions. Um, customers adopt a wide variety of payment tools. So you've got things like, right now, you've got things like PayPal or whatever Uber does. But customer preferences, their trust, the way they interact are rapidly evolving. And time, trust, content, speed, ease of use all play into all of this. Um, aggregated flows of data become difficult to acquire and monetization of data becomes much more difficult. So here on one hand, we're talking about how you can make use of the vast data to kind of offer better products and services. But actually, you know, if it's becoming di difficult because of fragmentation, how's that going to work? 
so I think some key takeaway points from the payments piece is um, if you look at three areas, so data monetization, so um, new competition, increased regulation will continue to make core pay payments activities less profitable. Right? This leads to payment providers focusing on how to monetize data for key revenue. And actually, the data itself becomes more valuable where they are granular, product level, multi dimensional. Now, if you think of us as a, from a regulatory point of view, having that le level of data, granular data on payments, which gives you much more view across of what's going across the economy, allows you to make much more targeted and defined um, deci um, sort of decisions, give, give you more insight than what we currently get. Um, if we focus on things like localized payment needs, so in, instead of designing payment solutions based on technology, institutions will focus on how their customers prefer to pay and design payment solutions that fit their customers' lives, which will lead to regional solutions. Um, emerging countries with that mature payments ecosystems will also take the lead because, like I said before, they're the ones who can innovate and take bolder steps. They're not having to um, redevelop existing infrastructure. Um, and if you look at the power of the large merchants, so the ability of the large mer merchants, um, uh, so the ability of the large merchants to influence their customers' payment choices will grow, particularly on online transactions. So, um, and therefore, their negotiating power within those payment ecosystems will grow accordingly. Right? And with the increased importance of product level payments data, merchants will also be able to wield this power to get lower fees, to influence the broader evolution of the payments ecosystem. And this, you know, we'll talk about this later, but well, I'll mention this later, but this gives rise to the kind of, we have significantly uh, important <coughs> banks, significantly important uh, insurance companies. Will, will this lead to significantly important tech companies? I think so. So let's move on to insurance. Um, so to date, the major forces shaping the future insurance have been value chain pressures, new product needs, so Airbnb creates a whole area of new insurance, you know, just through that offering alone. Um, and increased in connectivity, so Nest provides um, IoT applications, so I think in this case, they had a smoke detector that was connected to wireless that the insurance company would also issue, so they could do real-time tracking of uh, fire risks, for example. Right? And the questions that have been asked, at, particularly around insurance, is would the pressures on the insurance value chain continue or would they lead to changes? Would insurance products change to changing customer lifestyles? Would connected products reach mass adoption across all types of insurance? I mean, you see a lot in, with car insurance um, at the moment. Um, and how would the development of life insurance evolve as growth markets shift? So the trend so far has been, well, the value chain is under enormous pressure and changes in purchasing patterns are forcing insurers to move away from the traditional one size fits all model towards a flexible, customizable range of products. And we can see that in a lot of areas where you can get little micro insurance for term things for very niche, niche, niche product sets. Um, increased modularity in the, in the insurance value chain is enabling new combinations of players and threatening the position of incumbents. I, we do see that trend, but also you see the major insurers really kind of going, well, actually, for them, it's just a different way of packaging their products. Uh, I also question, while this has you know, highlight, been highlighted as a trend, I also personally, I question it, because actually what we see is insurers, insurers actually being a bit more dynamic in how they're packaging and delivering their products. Um, you're seeing usage-based products based on demand and object-specific insurance products are emerging. Um, responding to customer lifestyles. Um, and <laughs> life, insurers, uh, life insurers face pressure to reinvent their product strategies to meet the needs of the next generation of customers. Um, what's not really been the trend? Well, while we're getting all these connected devices and Internet of Things devices proliferating, um, insurers have failed to convince customers that connected insurers serve their interests. So, Personally, I, I'm not one to get a black box in my car because I don't want my insurance company knowing what, not that I do anything dodgy, but going where I'm, knowing how fast I'm driving, how careful I'm driving, where I'm going, and so on. It's just, they already know a lot about us, but that's just me personally. But I, I, I see where this trend, is. this trend that hasn't really happened is coming from. So what does that lead us to ask? Well, how will the insurance consumption model change as the sources and natures um, of the liability changes in the future? 
should insurers change from being reactive to proactive with the rise of connected insurance and the need to monitor customer risk on an ongoing basis? Potentially, I think it depends on what area of risk you want to monitor. I mean, I, monitoring a fire alarm for, to prevent the fire, does it, uh, how, what, what, what is the value in some of these pro propositions? I mean, you have to ask yourself. Um, will the industry be able to develop guidelines for the use of that data and how will those guidelines differ around the world? Do customers want to engage with their insurer more often? I certainly don't. Um, how will insurers match their life products to fit the different conditions in emerging markets? And will increasing integration and focus on prevention lead to success for connected products? Possibly. So future scenarios we can consider, you know, challenging the channel. So insurers improve their customer facing digital experiences. We're seeing a lot of this, right? How they're packaging, delivery, you know, how they integrate their their insurance offerings with the specific products, right? So it's much more seamless. You know, sometimes you don't know you're getting insurance, but it's built in as part of it. And consumers benefit from products being tailored to their needs. You know, we only want to pay for things that, you know, I'm very specific in the insurance that I want from a particular company. I don't want X, Y, Z, but I also want to know that I'm trusted to get the things I'm paying for. I'm not going to be subject to some fine print, right? So these things are going to be easier and seamless. Underwriting by machine. Now, you know, if you're getting a lot more complex products, new products coming to market, underwriting becomes increasingly complicated and it strengthens the role of an AI could play in that. Now, third party underwriting, with AI expertise, will become the industry standard. Um, and insurers, you know, two diverging paths can be created for customers and insurers will face a battle to differentiate themselves. We'll see the rise of the um, flexible products, so um, prosumers, not consumers, will force insurers to connect business and personal insurers. Insurers will use technology to enable time flexibility. Insurers engage with consumers to monitor coverage. Um, but customers may be caught off guard by inconsistent coverage. Now, this is down to T's and C's and how well these products are explained. Um, life insurance, so e easy life insurance. So. Um, Insurers develop digital channels for product distribution. We're seeing a lot of that already, but that will become more and more prevalent. Um, term products rise in popularity as demographic shift. Um, and life insurers will deprioritize agents and investments and may play direct. So key takeaway points for this, the value chain shift. So once tightly vertically integrated, the insurance value chain is rapidly being modularized by sort of new technologies that allow activities to be split across a lot of different players. Um, and leading organizations are using this modularity to their advantage. So they pursue fle flexible partnerships um, that allow them to aggressively complete for adjacent profit pools. Um, we've got a lot more complex products that are then simply distributed. So to remain competitive, insurers need to simultaneously achieve two seemingly contradictory objectives. On one hand, they must develop complex and highly personalized products to meet customer needs. And on the other hand, they will need to significantly simplify the origination process, enabling even highly complex products to be sold directly through online and mobile channels. The communication for me is key in all this, making sure that the end customer understands what they're buying and how, and they're getting what they have signed up for is, is key. So trust is going to be key to delivering all of this. Um, and connected insurance will fundamentally change the way insurers operate, shifting their focus from risk assessment to risk prevention, um, and perhaps creating the imperative to work with the original equipment manufacturers to build in connections. Um, now they must, to do this, they must overcome kind of existing perceptions of connected insurance and convincing customers that actually they represent an improvement over current products. There is an apathy amongst uh, consumers of insurance to actually change or move away from the norm. And there is a trust issue there as well. Digital banking. Right, this has been an area that has really changed rapidly. Um, so today, some of the forces shaping the future of banking have been virtual banks, like Fedor or Monzo, for example, in the UK mobile banking channels or banking platforms. And the questions that have been asked today around this, would, would virtual banks be able to capture market share for incumbents? How would the emergence of banking platforms affect developments in digital banking? 
how would banks be able to deploy digital solutions with a legacy architecture? Right? For me, the first and the last one are kind of really important questions on that. And if you look at the example of um, some new challenger banks within the UK, yeah, some of them started around 2010. Um, they haven't made a profit. They're finally in, 20, sorry, in 2017 and now turning a profit. So it's taken a while, but they are gradually um, uh, building market share. So trends so far. So um, traditional bank distribution models and economics are at risk of being deeply disrupted by the drive towards platform models of banking. Banks are no longer defining customer expectations of the banking experience. Instead, fintechs and large tech companies have set the standard. And fintechs and large tech are used to making things easy to use, making things seamless. Um, and you know, we as consumers expect things to happen at one click or seamlessly. Um, and banks have had to kind of get with that. Um, Incumbents are starting to migrate core systems to the cloud as legacy infrastructure creates challenges in meeting customer needs. And this is an important step to um, allow incumbents to be more agile, move away from legacy systems and so on. Um, and as I mentioned, fintechs are now setting the level of expectations that customers have for banks. Um, with the emergence of platform banking models, banks are trying to evolve but are weighed down by legacy systems. So, um, but unfortunately, these shifts to from legacy infrastructure to cloud or wherever it might be do take time, um, whereas fintechs start from that position already. What hasn't really been the trend? Well, few customers have really moved away from the traditional deposit accounts despite significant efforts online and mobile challenger banks. So what, what did these sort of trends raise about the future? Well, will PSD2 be a game changer for the industry in Europe? I think so, as you, as you move to building more API-based smart infrastructures, smart financial centers, I think actually something like PSD2 could be a really you know, positive catalyst for that. And we're seeing that, for example, in Singapore, where actually they want to build a smart financial center, a whole API-based infrastructure, and certainly a lot of their government services, if we look at that, are based off um, uh, API services, which actually you can pull up on your phone, you have one app, you can access all your government services, that API app to all the various different departments, and you can have your, you know, your, your water sorted at the same time having it, your trash collected. So this is the world that we're moving to. Um, will customer interest in open banking models continue in light of growing cyber insecurity? What are the banks' uh, business models for large tech companies expand, expanding into banking? I think a lot of them are, are now showing that they want to do more payments. Facebook, for example, has uh, indicated it wants to get into the payment space, whereas so Amazon. Um, how can incumbent banks transfer their competitive advantage to the digital world? Um, and what partners will banks choose to set up their long-term digital strategy? So these are really important questions for the future of, of digital banking. Now, to kind of focus on a couple of scenarios again, um, we can see the emergence of things like controlled curated platforms. So banks will outsource product design for less pro profitable products. Banks form collections of best of breed products from various sources. Customers benefit from diverse and customized product offerings. And fintechs focus on white label and co branded products that they could actually then supply to incumbents um, who can then brand it as grown. We'll see things like tech aggregation platforms. So large tech firms create distribution platforms. <coughs> fintechs and smaller banks extend partnerships with large tech firms. Customers embrace the ability to purchase from large tech firms. And incumbents are forced to decide whether they join tech platforms tech platforms will stay isolated, and I think actually they will have no choice but to do that. Um, we'll move to an open platform world, so legislation or customer pressure forces banks to use open APIs. Third parties use APIs to develop their own products. New entrants directly compete with traditional bank products, and financial institutions choose to focus on single segments of the value chain. Some key takeaways. So. Um, Distribu distribution versus manufacturing. So the rise of product platforms and digital banking will force market participants to make a choice between a strategic focus on product distribution, or i.e. becoming the platform, or focus on product manufacturing. This choice will have far-reaching uh, implications for their business and customer interaction models, as well as their competitive landscape. Um, there'll be fewer but bigger winners. So the advantage of being the market leader will increase uh, significantly for both product manufacturers and product distributors. 
Um, platforms will offer customers improved transparency into products, significantly increasing the advantage for the best products. And for distributors, significant economies of scale in access to data and customer awareness will feed, feed a cycle of growth. Um, and then ecosystem imperatives. So under all these sort of possible end states, digital banking institutions will forge more relationships with other financial services and increasingly non-financial services firms, meaning that within the digital banking ecosystem, a proficiency for establishing partnerships and a willingness to create win-win symbiotic relationships will lead to more partners. And you know, collaboration and trust is key for, for the future uh, digital banking. Lending, another, ex another exciting area. There's been a lot of development over the last few years. Um, now, today, the forces shaping the future of this have been mass P2P lending, uh, credit ease, and so on. Alternative, alternative adjudication, so uh, companies like Cabbage, and lean and automated process, uh, the lending club. Now, the alternative adjudication one is a really interesting one because it, means, uh, it provides a means for people who are less credit worthy, who haven't had good credit history or so on, um, to find sources of cheap, you know, inclusive lending. And the questions that have been asked today have been, well, would incumbent lenders react to new entrants' speed and prowess? Would low credit or thin file customers, i.e. those needing alternative adjudication, benefit from alternative adjudication services? And would P2P lending be able to grow and compete <coughs> with uh, the traditional banks? Now, what's been the trend? Well, um, new adjudication techniques have significantly expanded access to credit for underbanked, thin file, and subprime customers. Uh, individual and small business borrowers expect their lender to deliver the seamless digital uh, origination and rapid adjudication pioneered by leading fintechs. Non financial platforms are emerging as an important source of underwriting data and a point of distribution for credit. And fintechs are using data to provide customers with a pain-free ending, pain-free um, lending services, and customers want the same efficient, seamless experience with their banks. Additionally, consumers can choose from a multitude of financial and non-financial providers. What really hasn't been the trend? Well, funding economics put marketplace lenders at a cost disadvantage compared to traditional banks, raising questions about the model sustainability. Um, and fintechs are struggling to find a sustainable business model in the face of funding instability. So what does this raise about the future? Well, how much more effective will underwriting become with new sources of data and analytical techniques? We talked about before that underwriting, underwriting will, have to be, will have to move to become much more AI-based. And with much more data, I believe it will become much more effective, uh, but also ca uh, cater for the types of complexities you're dealing with in this space. Um, will platform-based lending become a relevant distribution channel? What is the long-term impact of marketplace lenders licensing their underwriting technology? Will marketplace lenders move to provide direct lending? And how will the borrower's preference of distribution channels, channels evolve? Now, some interesting stats around kind of um, P2P payments and lending. 44% 44 uh, 44 of those people earning less than $75,000 would trust a tech company to do their P2P payments. And this goes up to 68% for those morning, uh, so morning, uh, for those that are earning more than $100,000 uh, $100, um, who, who would also trust um, a tech company to do their P2P payments and lending. So that's, those are quite interesting stats, I think. So possible future scenarios. You'll have different evolutionary paths for late lending providers. So marketplace lenders are challenged as funding costs rise. Um, Marketplaces are further specialised in target niche areas. Other marketplace lenders seek to become banks. Um, customers benefit, especially in niche areas. Um, now, shared services providers. So uh, certain marketplace lenders become B2B service providers. Banks find service providers more capable and cost effective than their own internal functions. Service providers flourish and become indispensable. And the industry's cost base becomes commoditised. Distribution 2.0, so lenders form partnerships with non-financial firms. Non-financial firms use their platforms to originate loans. Lenders begin to offer more customized products using additional data. And consumers benefit from loans at the point of need. So key takeaway points uh, around lending, so 
lower funding costs will win. So despite innovations in, in origination and adjudication, the online lending model is fundamentally limited by high unstable funding costs in its ability to compete with banks. So there's a need for a consistent funding source at a cost similar to that of deposits for banks, or uh, um, otherwise it will drive online lenders to acquire banking licenses, right? unless they've got alternative sources of funding. Um, finally, lending will go digital. So marketplace lenders and technology firms have reoriented, reoriented uh, customer ex expectations. Uh, leading lenders are expected to offer simple credit origination experiences where a combination of design and automation provides customers with a frictionless application experience and a swift response. And lenders begin to use data more effectively. So leading lenders are using data to improve both the effectiveness and the efficiency of their adjudication processes. They employ new sources of data to underwrite applications whose risk could not be previously assessed, i.e. thin file under you know, subprime customers, and reduce underwriting costs by automating the collection and an analysis of key data. Moving forward, lenders will increasingly look for new signals and data to inform lending decisions. <coughs> On to the last two, so we've got investment management and then market infrastructures and then uh, and to cover off. So around uh, investment management, um, to date, the big, some of the forces that have been shaping the future have been the rise of robo-advisors big data-driven analysis, and B2B externalization. Um, questions have, that have been asked today really have been, was robo-advisory the right answer for the majority of customers? This is mad rush towards um, automating everything and uh, not talking to humans anymore to save costs, but at what expense? Now, how would companies look to B2B externalization as margins continue to decline? And would monoline fintechs be able to capture market share? <coughs> What's been the trend? Well, as individuals become more responsible for, invest for their investments, robo distribution has become the most compelling tool for customer engagement. Scaling the delivery of investment advice requires fewer resources as middle and back office functions are increasingly being automated or externalized. And the growth of low-cost products has increased the importance and scale of product manufacturing and driving pressures for consolidation. Now, what has been the trend? Well, new entrants to investment management have struggled to gain market share in the face of customer stickiness and high customer acquisition costs. Trust is a big factor in this. There's a reason customers are sticky, right? I'm not going to move for my own investment provider, right? And also, if, if I want investment advice, I want to talk to someone I can look in the eye that I will get advice from. That will vary by person by person, but that's just my own risk tolerance. But you can see why this hasn't really been a trend. So trust is going to be a big key. What questions do these trends raise about the future? Well, to what degree will product manufacturers move upstream and disrupt distributors? Um, probably more likely. Um, how will wealth managers differentiate their robo-advisory offerings? For me, this is going to be down to the quality and detail and credibility of the advice that they offer. Um, will clients continue to prefer low-cost investments or will guaranteed outcome products become popular? Do people really have the attention span to keep monitoring their investments or they just want to go, you know, I'll put my money here and I know I'm going to get X amount at the end of the term. I see that being more of a trend. Um, how will the role of human advisors and the job requirements change? That's a really interesting one. Um, and will product manufacturing be characterized by more or less scale? Um, some possible future scenarios. So you're going to get certainty-based offering. So retail clients will have less access to traditional pensions. Potentially, retail clients will become more attractive se to more, a more attractive segment than institutional cli clients. Um, Robo-advisors condition clients to expect certainty. I think that's probably true. If I'm going to have a robo advisor, I will want to be like, know what I'm being given, right? Asset management develops and delivers guaranteed outcome products. For me, this would be a really good end state. Um, now, advice is a differentiator. So clients, especially millennials, flock to robo advisors. And algorithm-driven interfaces expand across multiple asset categories. Wealth becomes a primary point of uh, interaction with it, with financial institutions. And data sharing agreements become much more important to understand consumers. That last one is really important, I think, for the future of this particular space. Um, 
quality externalization. So more and more cloud and platform as a service providers emerge, benefits of scale erode as high quality execution become the norm. Much of the market gets consolidated into large firms that can afford differentiated technology. And many specialized smaller wealth managers thrive by appealing to niche markets. We're seeing a lot of that. So some sort of key, uh, key takeaways. So differentiated offerings. So um, the ongoing industry-wide automation and externalization of middle and back offices, combined with the ubiquity of um, robo-advisory offer offerings, are commoditizing the investment and in advisory uh, value proposition. Um, consequently, uh, leading firms will seek to identify and invest in other ways of differentiating themselves to stand apart from their competition. Um, now, advice-driven customer guidance. So as, as robo-advisors become more ubiquitous and um, sophisticated, leading investment management companies will look to these capabilities to deepen their engagement with robo-advisory customers, drawing on new sources of data to deliver advice on all aspects of their financial lives. Importantly, I think humans are still going to have a role, right? So the human advisor will still be crucial when differentiating products and services, especially for high net wealth customers. But the role of such advisor will shift in leading companies from product selection to focusing on customer engagement, building trust, emotional intelligence, and decision support. Let's move on to market infrastructures as the final kind of piece in this jigsaw. Um, so the major forces shaping the future of market infrastructures to date have been capital requirements coming from the BIS, new platforms for OTC markets, and market regulations. And the questions that have been asked today have been, well, how would electronic platforms develop and which assets would be digitized? What effect would continued regulation have on the development of new trading tools? And how would incumbents seek to respond to new technologies used by startups? What's been the trend so far? Well, traditional OTC products continue on their journey towards digitization, driven by regulation and the promise of improved economies of scale. The efforts of electronic platforms to scale up are complicated by an uncertain and regionally fragmented regulatory environment and political instability. Um, and market infrastructure providers are disrupting themselves to preserve a pivotal role uh, in future processes and un unlock new, new uh, revenue streams. Now, what hasn't really been the trend? Well, new platforms have rarely challenged incumbents, and they said see joint ventures and partnerships as the most successful path to scaling up. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk of disrupting incumbents, but the reality I really hasn't hasn't been that. So, what does this? What questions do we want to ask about the future? Well, what will political disruption and potential deregulation mean for the platform trading and proliferation? Um, how will buy-side investors demand for innovation and new business models to, to shape the platform universe? How far away are disruptive technologies such as AI and DLT from applicability and scalability in a production environment? AI, perhaps less so, DLT has got a fair way to go, I think, in my personal view. Um, what will drive the necessary cooperation to embed new business models into the existing ecosystem? And how will disruptive technologies affect the value chain and individual roles in market infrastructures? So possible future scenarios here. So if you look at platform proliferation, um, market platforms enhance their tools and tools and standardized languages. Trading in many asset classes becomes easier. Market participants adopt platforms en masse. And platforms continue to innovate as usage rises, thus consolidating their market position you may end up with some data infrastructure collision. So data-focused firms expand within the platform area. Infrastructure providers leverage information custody to provide data services. As a result, these players find themselves on a collision course. Right? And users increasingly have fewer providers for both data and for infrastructure. Will we see new post-trade value chains? Well, infrastructure providers disrupt the capital markets value chain. Improvements lead to new market structures. Some entities leave the ecosystem while others redefine their role. I think we'll see a lot of that. Um, and additional resources are freed up by improvements to processes. We'll, we'll definitely see a lot of that. Some key takeaways for this. Well, technology alone is insufficient. So new technological solutions are insufficient to enable the creation of new market infra infrastructures or to drive significant change in the existing infrastructure. 
This will make minimum viable ecosystems of cooperating stakeholders critical to development. Now, leading players from both the public and private sphere will seek to actively participate in and shape the direction of these stakeholder groups. Um, navigating regulatory regionalization uncertainty. So, you know, we're seeing this a lot at the moment where differing, regu differing regulatory direction around the world will, li will likely lead to both regionalization and uncertainty in the short and medium term. Financial institutions will need to develop the flexibility to rapidly adapt to both large-scale regulatory changes and regionally divergent regulatory treatment of emerging market infrastructure technology. Um, and value chain pressures and opportunities. So regulation and technology advances are driving efficiencies, which will put pressure on incumbents to consolidate their positions and thus shorten the value chain. Forward-looking firms will seek to position themselves in areas that will continue to add value and increase areas uh, occupied by, uh, currently occupied by, firm, uh, by other firms. Oh. So just sort of wrapping that up, I hope that was a sort of good, there was quite a lot to take in around the sort of the six aspects of the ecosystem and looking at kind of trends and where we've ended up to, and, uh, hopefully you kind of stay with me with that. Um, but I think going forward, <laughs> rather than talking about kind of what, we've talked a lot about what might happen, it's important to talk about the forces that will shape the future of financial ecosystem rather than kind of, because they're the ones that are going to drive the trends and what may happen. It's very difficult to, to predict what's going to happen in 20 years' time. But systemically important tech companies, right? We will have banks, insurance companies, they're all systemically important, but the tech companies are going to be there, right? You may find your PayPal's, your Facebook's, all these well become subject to regulatory scrutiny at some point, right? There is. Uh, there are regulators who do on-site technical supervision of their firms, right? But this may change the supervisory remit, may change. The, also, the, the line between banks and tech companies may become blurrier over time. So the role for us as a regulator, where our supervisors will need to become perhaps more tech, tech and data savvy than they currently are. And my personally, personal view is, is that it's, in this day and age, there's no excuse for a supervisor not to have any tech or data experience, or to say, well, that's the job of a data or a techie person, and we'll just kind of dismiss it. It's their job to understand that too. Um, cost commoditization, you know, we're not in the world of big profits. Consolidation, TCO, um, you know, making things commodity are going to be really key to understanding how um, the future involves in terms of new tech. Profit distribution, experience ownership, the rise of platforms, um, monetizing data, you know, if, if in three years' time we're going to be have uh, uh, financial firms are going to have 20 times more usable data than they have today. Data monetization is going to be absolutely key. How do you get really good insight from the data you're collecting? And who's it useful for? And what does that, what does that allow you to kind of develop, uh, <coughs> develop from? Bionic workforce. And I put that on to be a slightly controversial, but that's kind of this whole robo-advisor, human advisor type thing, not kind of a, a cybernetic kind of person who's sitting behind yeah, at your bank. Um, financial regionalization. So, you know, we've all of us have been contributing to the new global sort of frameworks for reporting, but we are seeing regionalization happening. It's not to say global rules have don't have a place anymore, they do. But also different regions will have their own uniqueness, um, customer experience, kind of cultural things that they, they um, that will influence how the technology evolves. And lastly, the important thing is the sharing economy. We're seeing more and more sharing economy, renting economy taking place. And I think this is going to be a big trend in how some of these products evolve as well uh, and all these ecosystems evolve. Um, and that's it. So it's not my usual sort of presentation. Hopefully you found it interesting. Um, thank you. I'll take questions if, if you have any. So. Benjamin, many, many thanks, because this is pretty much exactly what we spoke about, to take a look at what is there and what could we expect in the future. Any questions from the audience? I think we'll have a few, because that pretty much set the, the background for the entire discussion today. So, Thank you. That was an absolutely fantastic and thought-provoking presentation. Well, I'm not even sure whether some of my thoughts are in there or not. There was so much stuff there. So he, here's my question. Maybe it's under sharing economy. So 
before the camera, this is not true. Uh, I am thinking of starting a new insurance company. Excuse me. I'm thinking of starting a new non-insurance company called I Can't Believe It's Not Insurance. And Leave says, I am so tired of paying the exorbitant fees for life insurance. If you could give me a policy at half the cost, that would be wonderful. So she enters into an agreement. And then Michael and Michael and Ignacio and Watasan and I, we all pick up and we say, we will receive uh, through smart contracts a portion of that. And smart contracts, if the transaction is registered that a life event happens, will take the, the cryptocurrency from our accounts and pay off. And it's not an insurance company. It's a sharing wow. economy. It's I can't believe it's not insurance. Is, was that in there? Is that sharing economy? Is that encompassed? Whether it's banking on the one side or the insurance on the other, is, is that a possibility? Will regulators stop that? How does that work? So, I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. So on the point about would regulators stop that, I can't comment or won't comment on that, but that what you described see the ecosystem developing because there are some interrelationships between what one part of the ecosystem can expect and how that affects the other and certainly when you come through <sighs> things like the sharing economy and those forces that does capture the sentiment of what they're describing so this was not saying it was, it's not going to be very binary it's saying these are sorts of the forces now it's an ecosystem so the force on one side will affect the other side it's like the butterfly effect of a hurricane for example so I think what you described is generally is, is, is captured in there. I mean, I heard of a proposal around, for example, same sort of idea where, um, I can't remember who it was, um, but someone from this community anyway, was saying they were driving down, uh, well, their boss was driving down a road one day and uh, didn't take out, um, wind, they hired a car, didn't take out windscreen insurance, got a chip, and then had to pay like 1,500 pounds out for that chip. And they thought it was really unfair, but actually, what if there was a way of doing what you described in terms of, well, actually, I'll, rather than rather than pay, it, th there must be some fund I could pay into where actually I wouldn't have to pay 1,500, but I would have to pay about maybe 50 pounds to get it repaired. But I paid into this kind of share in the fund where if something like that happens, I can draw on that, and the community the community can decide whether to authorize that payment. I think you'll see a lot of that. But then you know, there is the fact that people are kind of, their attention spans are not really there. They're less patient. Have they got time to be this kind of insurance judging community? Or who's going to be that person who says, yeah, actually, we're going to approve that transaction as part of the community? So there's, there's some things that are going to, I think, societal changes that will come about from this. So I, that. I mean, it, it's the whole kind of blockchain argument as well, saying, yeah, it's going to do away with all the market infrastructures in the next five years. Well, these things have been built up over 25 to 30 years. There's a whole society dependent on it. Now, if you can't, you can change the technology. If you can't deal with the, so the societal impact and the cultural change of it, which is actually the thing that will slow everything down, um, then actually it's not going to. Things may not change as fast as you might want them to. Some things may change because actually it's the right thing to do and they get quicker adoption. But other things do require cultural societal change. So, does that answer your question? Any other questions? Any further from the audience? I'll have one. I'll go back to one of your points. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Millions of questions. <laughs> I'll ask you three. The first one, um, you mentioned about nine different factors at the end. Yeah. There's no mention of identity management in the context of trust. So just maybe get a comment from you on that. Okay, let me, let's do one at a time. Yeah. So I purposely didn't put identity in there. That's better, yeah. I didn't put, I put, I, I've stayed away from specific piece of technology, but you're right. Um, have the dig a digital identity is absolutely is key. So that is that the way that evolves would, would be a force, but it's, I wouldn't say it's um, the, the the trends I sort of described were 
sort of bigger, more macro type forces rather than specific things. But you're right, um, identity management is, 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 is key to a lot of that. So kind of enable that change that you want to see throughout the ecosystem. If you want more seamless payments or uh, lending or, you know, uh, these kind of adjudications on insurance products, yeah, you'll need that <coughs> constant digital kind of identity through that. But that's, I think that will come through that evolution of technology, yeah. Another question for you then. You, you mentioned as well about the concept there of, um, I can't remember the exact words you used, but effectively it's defined outcomes, so guaranteed outcome products. Yeah. Is that not effectively a recipe for a Ponzi scheme? Could be. Yeah. Could be, yeah. Okay. Because that, that's. But that's then. Uh, it struck me because I, I could get controversial and say, well, actually, yeah. there's a lot of Ponzi schemes out there that are legitimate. So. <laughs> so. But you're right. I mean, this is yeah. we we had this thing. I think uh, my, uh, in the UK, uh, something to do with mortgages of years back. Uh, I forget what they're called, but my dad fell for it. So. <laughs> okay, and a, a third one then. You, you mentioned as well about IoT and insurance, mm. and let's say connected products and connected insurance and whatever else. And it seemed from what you spoke about that the customer was the person most likely to be the, let's say, the barrier to those type of products becoming mm. popular. In my experience, it's as likely to be the insurance company as it is to yeah, be the, um, the customer. Yeah, And I think that a lot of insurance companies and potentially other, let's say, incumbents pay lip service to be seen to be involved in these, let's say, new areas of technology. <coughs> But don't actually bite the bullet and go go and actually do anything about it. I th I th you, I th that, that's a that's a very true point because I mean you have got your more tech savvy companies like Aviva and so on who are going down that route, but also not really being obvious about it. They've either partnered or got products that don't really look like theirs. But if you get into London market insurers, right, who are really old school paper based kind of books, you know banging bells at lunchtime and, and so on. If anyone's been to London Market, it's a fascinating building. Um, really weird, old world kind of London finance. Um, but you're right, I think you're not going to see that move within there, but they often deal with a lot of these niche products, being London Market. Um, but they are the sort of thing where the agent or someone wants to have a direct conversation with someone and have the handshake in the pub. But that might change in time. I don't think a lot of that's going to go away though because there is an element of trust where you're doing deals on specific niche products. You want to know you're covered and that kind of that drink you have with that guy you know in the pub is that trust that you know automation or a machine can't replicate. If, like I said I want to look someone in the eye. If I'm giving them my money I want to look them in the eye and go yeah I'm happy to do that or I trust you you're going to look after me. Um, I don't I don't I'm all for technology, I love innovation, but I still don't get how you're going to overcome that one piece. And I think that that's where you'll see a lot of change, but ultimately it'll come down to me looking someone in the eye, knowing I want to do business with you or not. So, but then again, 20, you know, 10, 20 years is a long time. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I might have a virtual person pop up, but I can look in the eye. <laughs> so. Thanks very much. Um, Thank you, Declan. Daniel, did you have some questions? Well, I have one, but it's, it's not directly you, but I think you're a good source of info. Uh, which is the feedback after two years of being uh, uh, aggressively deploying sandboxes? How do you feel with it? Do you see the successful approach? With, with so what the FCA do is a, is a sandbox. Um, what we do is an accelerator. The accelerator is look. But what, what, what we've done is we've looked at technologies not to promote fintech or anything like that, to look at how those technologies would help us as an institution. And we've done a number of different um, proof of concepts. Um, we're in our fourth cohort. Um, I think I can say this publicly now, but we're doing, we're doing a POC with NTT Data and Wadison at the moment on um, HBL processing and data management. Um, but to date, we've done things on things like distributed ledger, machine learning, privacy, um, data aggregation, and so on. Um, now, we've done proof of concepts to understand um, 
to answer questions about technology that we don't really fully understand that will help us make decisions, big decisions. Um, RTGS is a good example. So everyone went, well, you should just do real-time growth settlement on the blockchain. Well, that's great, but Ethereum's not developed enough. Would I put RTGS on the Bitcoin network? Probably not. Ripple was just in its sort of fledgling status at that point. Um, and then you've got all these other new, um, you know, new, new offerings that are coming along. What that did was it, um, up until then, everyone in the bank, um, other than technology, were looking at the technology and doing paper-based assessments, going to a conference. And in 2015 and 2016, and probably the first part of this year, every single presentation on blockchain and DLT was, what is blockchain? What is DLT? This is what it does to you. And for two years, you couldn't get past that conversation because every single person out there was the expert because they gave a presentation on what is blockchain. The only differentiator in all the conferences I've been to was when Anne Binney started talking about um, financial inclusion. This was in the XBR conference in Singapore. And that was the first time someone said something different about DLT. Now, for us, what it did was it, it stopped those questions. It educated our um, sort of business areas, so notes and RTGS and, and across the bank to say, what is this technology? And we did that through a very simple proof of concept, which uh, some of you might have seen. No, actually, no one's seen. You saw it, yeah, you saw it. Um, um, and that answered a lot of questions that said, well, actually, this is what technology does, this is what it doesn't do. Um, and rather than steaming on to going, well, how do, how do we do um, um, uh, DV, debt versus payment through our, through this proof of concept. Actually, well, we've learned enough about this. What's the next thing that we want to go and answer? So we thought, actually, what we want to do is make sure that the decisions we take around RTGS mean that it's blockchain compatible in the future. So we did a proof of concept with Ripple, where we created a, uh, a, a kind of, um, we did an international settlement using Ripple as an intermediary. Um, and the next one we're doing to, uh, on blockchain is um, with Chain, which is around exploring privacy. So it's taking the really key questions. So some of it's been around education. Some of it's going, well, actually, we're really interested in how machine learning would work across regulatory data and for the supervision of credit unions, right? It's 500 very sort of mid to very small firms um, report once a year, or quarterly or once a year. <coughs> data, if, if you could automate the supervision off through machine learning, would be great. So we're doing some POCs on that. We did one, we're doing a second one with the same thing. So what's doing is teaching us the direction we want to go in. Some of it's been educational, some of it's been, all right, this is the direction we want to go in. Um, there's other applications like we did for cybersecurity where we did with Palantir. That became a product that we're using within the bank. Um, so that Palantir runs um, some of our cybersecurity stuff. It basically watches us all the time. Uh, so if I move a file from A to B, it knows that I've done it and will say, oh, you shouldn't have moved it to B and flag it to someone in, in the organization. So we're, we, we are heavily monitored by that. So there's some things that we brought in. Other things we're looking at to see how they might be used, right? So uh, Enforced is a, a company that mines a lot of legal text um, and looks at those things. They're very good for our legal and supervision team, so we're looking at how we might take them forward. Um, Privitar was another company that did an external cyber security assessment, I think, of, of a firm, saying, well, based on all these external data that it's getting about a firm, they're saying, well, actually, this firm's, you know, low risk, high risk in terms of kind of, uh, or that their kind of controls are weak or good. Uh, um, I personally, I don't see too much value in that one because how much can you really tell from an external profile about a firm's cyber security because that's all internally facing kind of lockdown, but that's a different issue. So uh, two years on, it's been really useful. But two years on, we're going to go, well, what does that mean going forward? We can't continue doing the same thing for two years because if you look at what other institutions are doing around the world, they're all moving forward. They're coming up with policies, some out of necessity. So the EBA published that paper. Um, no one's from the EBA here, so that's fine. But, you know, l largely out of... You know, you've got all the other institutions, EOPA, everyone going, actually making progress, having conferences, talking about stuff. EBA really haven't done anything on this yet, so they published this paper and said, we're going to focus on these things. But some of it is reactionary, some of it is genuine. Um, for us, it's, we haven't published any kind of, this is how we might regulate it, or this is what our policy is in relation to this. And I think we're still very open because we don't want to come in now while it's still fledgling, particularly with Brexit looming and saying, let's kind of 
put a, a wrap around it. And we want to see where it goes, where the risks are going, because they change day by day. I, mean, I had a conversation with supervisors um, the other day, and I was in our, our FinTech working group, and uh, they were talking, well, you know, um, they were assessing the risks that APIs pose. I sort of was a bit baffled. I mean, my API is just a technology for these two things to talk, or these multiple things to talk. So, yes, there might be risk in the technology, but the risk is actually in the business model that you put around it, not in the tech. Uh, but they were assessing the tech risk, but they're not tech e experts. <laughs> so, this is the sort of. So, for me, it's also um, two years on, it's about positioning me and, and the rest of us in technology as kind of the advisors to the business areas. And so, they don't have to do the pretend they're the tech experts. They can actually just come to us for advice. So we're, at the moment, we are reassessing what the future of it would be. I would say the focus is going to be around digital banking and around reg tech. This isn't public, but we push for those two things to be at the top. Reg tech, for me, is a, is a big thing. So yeah. Can I, can I Does that answer your question? Can I, I, I know we've extended a little bit in a very agile spirit the time of your session, but I, I cannot really not ask one particular question that relates to your presentation. You've touched on a number of points on the human interactions and the human factors, so to say, in all these considerations for direct tech. And what comes to my mind is actually um, yesterday, in, when I introduced the welcome words for the conference, I highlighted that the, building the trust in ecosystems is in equal measures a social function and a technological function. Regulation, standards, technological solutions, and then perceptions, emotions, fears of humans, innovation aspects, and so forth. In the evening at the beautiful Palazzo uh, Terrazzas de Cibeles, and thank you very much to Maria who have very kindly organized that, um, we chatted a little bit about this new concept uh, someone posted, I don't remember which company, assessing data not on the uh, uh, factors of true, false, or the binary factors of 1.0, but instead assessing data by emotions, a, a sort of like a spectrum of emotions given to people, and they judge the data by emotions. And Ignacio very nicely uh, uh, commented on that, that if you introduce that, then it's a very, very uh, fast forward way to um, receiving a lot of, uh, or, or, or promoting a lot of individuals such as a very, uh, particular gentleman uh, from across the pond with a very strange blonde haircut, right? Uh, posting a lot of those Twitter uh, very weird messages and actually affecting the emotions of people mm -hmm. through these kind of things, through the post facts, alternative facts and so on. Now, my big question is, is the rectech disruption going to be disrupted by the technological fears of people? And uh, emotions of people who don't really trust the technologies nowadays. They are scared of the technologies. There is a big gap between people saying, I will trust the AI solution giving me advice. I will trust the robot, uh, robot advisor giving me advice. I will rely on a cryptocurrency as a means of exchange of value. There is this massive gap to my understanding. What would, you, what would be your vision of that, or your, your view? So, I, I, I agree with all the things you pointed out is where that comes in, right? And they can, emotion can be easily influenced. And if you're doing point of time decisions on emotions, uh, emotions aren't, you have 10 of them. You might have one leading one, but it's influenced by several others of which you don't know what the combinations are, right? So the, the, the decision making that drives emotion based is, 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 is particularly, is very nuanced. Um, on the reg tech point, Distrust in technology. I mean, I, I see this all the time, where we, we are trying to enable reg tech as an institution. Um, we're only focused on reporting, but that all that does is it it, it creates. Um, I mean, the simple view of getting rid of someone's table view in Excel and giving them access to all the data that they can combine in any way they want is such a shift that they go, oh, I don't want that, I don't like that, I have to think, I have to do something, I can't just read. And there's such an aversion just to, just to that, where people think that technology is still this alien thing to them. So even though they go onto their phone and it's simplified, the simplification of this technology, uh, or sometimes the oversimplification of technology, if you look at Apple products, um, means that people don't have to think, they don't think that they have to think about technology data or not have to understand the underlying implications because everything's just instantaneous. 
but it's that sort of it's that view of this instant culture plus some apathy and cultural change that I wouldn't say it will disrupt reg tech, it will just hinder progression. That train is in motion, right? Things have to be easier, they have to be faster, they have to be cheaper. Um, and eventually people will just have to get out of the way, but they are going to be hindering it. Now, what we're seeing, I would say, two years on to, Dan to Daniel's point is it comes down to comms and awareness. So the, the accelerator work that we're doing, but this even goes out to the public, is, is actually educating them more on technology and data will really help. And it's a comm thing, right? Will really help kind of build that trust. But you have to talk to people about it. And you have to, you know, they have to understand what they're getting from it and why it will help them why it's better than the old way, or if it's not better than the old way, well, why should you have it more automated or things like that? Will it give more transparency? But if you're not communicating those things and the why, I mean, words like transparency don't really mean a lot of people, unless you're working in our sort of circles. But yeah, we get transparency, we have to do it every single day. But if you go and see what transparent means to a guy on the street, you know, they're not really gonna care. So it's how, we're, how you communicate these things. Um, so the, the human element will always be there, uh, is communication, and I don't think at the moment, if you're making data decisions on emotions, that's also tricky. That will influence how you trade and, and, and people's state at that point in time, but it is tricky, I think. But yeah, for me, communication is uh, the key to all trust things. If you're not talking to people, making them understand, it's not going to work. Okay. So maybe the last, probably, <laughs> but. I think it will be quite simple to ask, but probably not that easy to answer. We are hearing a lot of information about the reg tech, and let's just assume the reg tech in the space of compliance. How do you feel, what is your feeling about the risk transfer or risk being shared between the bank's insurance and the reg tech companies that are helping, let's say, to solve the compliance issue? So in this case, how do you see who is responsible in the end? Of course, you can say that it is the bank or insurance, but do you have some kind of a perception that maybe at some stage the reg tech companies will also have to be supervised, at least in some areas? Or what is your perspective for that? I, I had this question at a conference I was speaking at on Wednesday, um, literally the exact same question. Um, and luckily, the, the guy from the FCA was, was talking about it um, because that's mainly his area, but I did share his view. So, firstly, it's the banks that are responsible for compliance. RegTech software is just software, right? So, I can see Invoke in the room, right? So, Invoke is a software company, and I'm, so I'm calling you out. You provide software to insurance companies and banks, right? Arguably, you're RegTech, right? So a visor, so a bearing point if they're in the room, right? Because that's how everyone's being branded, but they provide the software, and you're responsible to ensure that it works, and the output you generate works, right? Such that my system will accept it. But the data that goes in and the compliance aspect of it is solely, this is my view, sits with the firm. Should a tech firm be subject to regulation? It depends on what they're doing. If they're doing reporting solutions, no. If, if, if there are checks and balances around, for example, monitoring of chats to make sure there's no insider trading and things like that, possibly. But then it's not the software company, it's the, it's the firm's controls and how they've implemented that software and their audit trails. Now the software, is just in the, the software providers are just enabling that. Um, there's a lot of questions around whether um, uh, things like cybersecurity is the same thing. You know, you could have the best cybersecurity thing in the world, but if, if your firewalls haven't been imp implemented properly by your infrastructure team, whose fault's that? Right? It's not. It's not the. It's not the cybersecurity firm. It's the fact that you didn't do your firewalls properly. So th there are things around that that I think um, all compliance is a firm. Ob from my point of view, is a firm obligation. Um, if the software company is straying into that arena or they're completely outsourced to provide that function for the bank, it's still the bank's problem to make sure that the firm that they've outsourced to is giving them the right thing. So there are times where we may go, might look at cloud providers, right? There, there is, people have been talking, do, you know, at what point does that create a risk to the, the system as a whole? Unless, unless software providers are providing kind of specific things that become critical to 
the financial stability and things like that, then I think then those questions will be asked. But and that will fall mainly into in infrastructure providers, cloud providers, data pro data sources, that sort of thing. Um, everything else I think is is uh, would be someone providing a service, but you know it's the, up to the bank to do, well the firm to do that. So I, yeah, that'd be. But that's only my opinion, so don't quote the bank on that. So. <laughs> Pedro, many thanks. Pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Pedro.